On the desert road to Baghdad, did you care? When the ground began to shake, were you there? With the dead along the streets, little kids beneath old sheets, was there time between your meets, in your chair? Did you care? Was it fair? I'm looking for a shadow, hoping for a drink, walking past an IED and trying not to think, fighting for a general a thousand miles away, eating lousy rations while he tries to cut our pay. So Robin, for the second time today, how are you, brother? I'm good. Uh, I managed to make my tea faster than you did. <laughs> yes. So uh, friends at home, massive welcome uh, to the podcast. Massive uh, welcome to welcome Robin back. I've just been off and uh, made myself a cup of tea because we've just done another podcast prior to this with... Um, Olympic, uh, Great Britain's Olympic, I hate to use the word hope, um, but I think that's the expression for the Paris 2024. It was Georgina Roberts and the three of us discussed shooting, which is her um, shotgun shooting is her, her discipline. Um, so now we're gonna go again and Robin's gonna very kindly discuss his latest publication, Warrior Poet, A Soldier's Songs. And I've had a read of this earlier. I uh, have to say, did uh, it, it got a bit smoky in here because um, I think that's a sign you've hit the spot, Robin, isn't it? I think it is. Uh, I think it is, Chris. The thing about, um, I think for my generation, especially when they, uh, hear about poetry, they go, oh my God, oh, don't talk to me about that. It's horrible. And they remember having to learn something at school in language that made absolutely no sense to them. And yet in real life, you know, every day, um, a lot of us quote poetry. We quote Shakespeare, which is all poetry. And, um, you know, we, we love rhyme and we love rhythm. And sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's sad. And the joy of making up a silly limerick, for example, uh, is great fun. But, um, and we love songs and songs, you know, are really poems with music. So it's a peculiar thing, but to hit the mark really, really well, it has to have emotion and emotion in words that are, um, that people can feel rather than remember. And it's a performance art, which is the thing about a book is that you have to try and get the whole rhythm uh, in your head, the way it works. So I, I put little, I put little sentences in before saying that we do inspire me. And in some cases, it's people like Benny Hill. Um, so you get the kind of patter that goes with it. And sometimes it has to be done with a hard Scottish accent. And it's available on Amazon. It's only available on Amazon because I could self-publish it. Um, publishers are still trying to catch up on last year because of COVID. So um, rather than sit on it and wait, but it's fully illustrated all the way through. Every, every two pages is fully illustrated with um, photographs turned into works of art. And yes, and there's one particular picture, if I can find it. I've just made a few marks here. Uh, uh, uh. Hang on a sec, bear with me. Look at this, wasting five minutes of our podcast 
you froze for me so there. Took, was I freezing? Just for a moment, yeah. Oh, God. Yes, this picture, I, I believe I stood next to that, isn't it, in Reykjavik? That's it, yeah. That's where I took it, yeah. Very modern, sort of modern art statue of, I'm guessing, what would have been a Viking longboat back in the day. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, we did the whole thing in black and white to add to the mood, which I think it really does all the way through. But, um, yeah, the illustrations are done by a, a wonderful illustrator called Tommy Brabham, who I met here in Prague. And um, in between the two of us, I think we produced something that's uh, rather extraordinary. Um, but, you, you know, it, there's war poems, there's love poems, there's um, funny poems. Um, there's some that are a real piss take. Um, you, you know, it's, it's something for everybody. But, uh, and it's something you can leave on your coffee table and talk about for the next three years. Yes, I think there's, um, I'm just going to say here and now, friends at home, what, what an absolutely excellent gift to give to anyone, not just whether they've been a veteran or not, but, but particularly if they have, um, this is going to resonate. This picture caught my, my eye, Robin, is that the... Um... That's one of my old friends, Stuart McLaughlin. Yes. Uh, um, he, um, he was killed just after the assault on Mount Longdon with three para. Um, and uh, I say, is he probably the only person I ever knew that I ever absolutely regarded as a hero, a great friend. I read all about his exploits, his bravery. Um, oh God, putting myself on the spot here in that wonderful book um, written by former para. I usually have my books on my shelf to jog my memory, uh, Vince Bramley. No, I don't uh, Vince know. Vince Bramley wrote a book. I think it was called something along the lines of Descent into Hell. For anybody watching who wants to read it, go into the notes below this video and you'll see my shop, Chris Thrall's, um shop, and that book is in, in my shop. It's just, just basically a direct link that takes you to Amazon. Um, lots of people said this gentleman should have won the Victoria Cross. Uh, uh, did I get that right? Yeah, I agree with that entirely. If anybody deserved a VC uh, in the Falklands, it was, uh, it was Stuart McLaughlin. He fought tirelessly on that mountain, uh, taking over when, when the higher command was getting killed, leading the younger soldiers and setting the example um, as they took out the enemy trenches, took out a lot, uh, a lot of enemy. And then, sadly, ultimately toward... I think even towards the end of that battle, lost his own life. No, he, he was he was wounded and um, he was walking back uh, to the medical aid station and, and an artillery shell at random killed him. God, mm. uh, awful. So how should we approach this, Robin? Shall I, shall I just quickly do a quick appraisal? Um, not appraisal, that's the wrong word, but um, I love this piece. Uh, dawn's early light. I won't read all of it, um, and I'm, I hope I can do it justice. If not, Robin, feel free to take over. But for endless years, we huddled in a dark night and defended ourselves from the. Co I'm probably not giving this the right cadence, but from the cold concealing, from the cold concealing ourselves in silent fear from the demons of hate hidden in the shadows. We waited, hoping beyond all hope that a new day would come after the long, long night, a night of years. It, what came into my mind was when we, when we were hunter-gatherers and we would have lived in caves and just that sheer uh, reassurance that daybreak brought when the sun came over the horizon and it was no longer dangerous animals prowling around and, and, and terrible cold to deal with. And also, um, I've read a lot of life raft stories like Stephen Callahan's 76 Days Adrift. Very brilliant book, folks. I think that's in my, in my shop. And that's it. That's it. It's about holding on when everything seems lost and holding on and holding on, enduring the uh, bad times. Um, say about people who are in despair um hold on 
Yeah. Yes. That's so. Uh, it's about that, and it's the last poem in the book. Um, so that, you know, there's some very profound stuff in there. There's some really funny stuff in there too, because you know you don't want to be all boom and gloom and misery. Um, you know, the 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 one on the, I think it's on page two, which is uh, useless banker. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, that's a funny one. I can read that for you quickly. Yeah, you, you go for it. You're going to do it better, more justice than I, than I probably did. Yeah. yeah. It says, it's a simple poem about excuses. The useless banker. You can't blame me for what I do. It's not my fault I work with fools. I tried for top celebrity, but ended up making people tea. I want to blame my mental health. Perhaps I'm lacking mental wealth. I couldn't cope, I couldn't work, I called my boss a stupid jerk. I couldn't wait despite the shapes, the drugs I took, but on the brakes. I didn't learn to read and write because my attitude was shite. I couldn't go for a position, work inflames my skin condition. I think that I should get more breaks. I think my mum should make me cakes. I think that I deserve much more. I re I'm really worth the pay of four. It's not my fault, I'm not a banker. I'm really, God made me a useless. <laughs> I think we all saw that, that line coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one, I think, is going to touch you uh, deeply in a few people's heart. I haven't got my glasses on, but about the sinking of the Sir Galahad mm. at Bluff Cove in 1982. Memories of the weather clearing, the sun shining, and the blood flowing in the water and the beauty of this it's it's so simple um it's both novel and 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 um just this the beauty of this is is the simplicity of this is beautiful i think so galahad gray ships gray seas gray skies blue skies red ships red skins Red Seas. Yes. And that was, um, oh, um, ah, no, it's gone. We'll, we'll, it was the Welsh Guards, um, you know, the, the jets came in, bombed them while they were on the ship. Yes, you know. I was just trying to think of the Royal Marines officer's name who, who was absolutely incandescent about it because i think he was in charge of amphibious landing and he told the welsh guards to get off or apologies if it wasn't the welsh guards he told but he'd he told he tried to organize them getting ashore and getting dug in and that's right that's exactly, that's exactly what happened the uh, royal marines were on shore two power were on shore with them but the marines sent out um, flat platforms to bring the troops to shore um before dawn or just after dawn, and um, they, um, the the commander of the guards officer in charge said, "I'll bring my men ashore when I want to." And um, uh, a short time later, the jets came in and um, hit the ships with the bombs and lost a lot of men. A lot yeah. of men. Should yeah. say hello to my friend Simon Weston. Simon, if you ever get to watch this, very graciously came on the on on the podcast. Mm -hmm. What an incredible, incredible human being. Yeah, does a lot of good work for other people. It really does. Can you read this one to us, Robin? Page 39. <coughs> I think uh, that's a picture uh, a, a lot of us dads will relate to. Yeah, that's a, that's a photograph that my wife took just after I got back from the Falklands. My um, first son, Alex, was born 10 days after the surrender. And um, well, that's me holding him. And it was called First Meeting. In the, in the Marines... Robin, we'd say get a haircut. In fact, get two haircuts. <laughs> uh, first meeting. Hello, here we are both with our roles. Mine father, your son, a joining of souls. Yes, and that last line, I think is where some fathers fall down, isn't there? You know, there's that, that, bond between a father and his son is so powerful for that little boy and it's a commit it's a commitment robin isn't it yeah i i i wrote about it back in with my first book 
fighting scared my autobiography and I said I felt that somebody had joined a, a, a piece of a, something a joined between us like a cord joined between us um, that could never be broken and if it was it would be one of the most painful experiences I could ever ever imagine you know and that's the same with all my children yeah I sat um, when I worked in Mozambique a place we both both worked in I was there as a um, let's, let's I was actually there as a development instructor but my role at the top the, my role was a teacher in a street children's school and I sat on the beach in Nicala, Nicala Porto, which was near to the, the village we worked in. And I was there, one of my students, Shamfar, obviously a child. Um, and being a street child, I said, well, you know, what, what happened to your dad? And he didn't answer. And when I sort of looked, he, I, I could see he was trying... Oh, it's going to set me off now. He was trying not to burst into tears. And he said, you know, Matar and the Guerra Grande, like killed in a big war. Um, and even though, you know, I, fortunately, I've still got my father. I, I, I just knew the how tragic you know, to lose your dad, the the one person a boy looks up to more than, who's going to look up to more than anyone else on the planet, to have him taken away and taken away by war. Um, God, we were both in tears, Robin. It was it was awful, absolutely awful. I was in the on Christmas 1990 or 89, I think. Um, I was part of that war. I was a major in Frelimo working out of Nampula in the north. And at Christmas, we drove to the sea, um, which was a bit risky, but we decided to go for it because we were very short of food and um, there was plenty of food on the coast. And um, we, got, uh, we got on the coast there, and managed to get some fresh fish and some meat and some even some champagne and some beer. And me and a guy called Roger Brown, we set up up the coast and we're going to have Christmas Day, having a barbecue on the beach by the sea, looking out at the ocean, rather than the uh, situation inland where there was a pretty tough war going on, starvation. And um, as soon as we arrived, there was nobody there. And then people started to gather around us, um, wanting a piece of what we had. And I got quite upset because I was like, this is the one day of the year where I want something for just for me and you people. And I was getting quite upset about it and quite angry. And uh, a mother sat down with a little boy and she un unwrapped some newspaper and she had some bread in. And she gave some bread to this little boy. And there was me trying not to share me champagne and not share me barbecue and get rid of these people. And um, the little baby boy, he's about three, uh, walked up to me and offered me a piece of his bread. Muslim um, philosophy, isn't it? Or Muslim way is you, you share half... <laughs> Half well, were Christians, but um, it was the uh, Scrooge had been visited <laughs> by the ghost of Christmas. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, as Westerners, Robin, we get these wake up calls when we go abroad. I mean, um, Mozambique, good example. Sort of what is it like a. It's a mix, isn't it? There's kind of a, a, a the, the witchcraft kind of thing going on there which is very serious and I, I met witch, witch doctors while I was there and met people people just took it so seriously then you've got the Christian influence and then of course you've got the Muslim influence but you get in a car with you know someone's you're driving down the road you see some hitchhikers you you pick them up it's a, a woman and a baby or a man and a woman one of them's got the malaria full-blown malaria and they're heading to the hospital to try to get some chloroquine or whatever it is and they're they're shaking but they're still smiling yeah and they get their their one bread out for the day and the first thing they do is rip it in half and and, and give you half and it, yeah. it that's right it was a country that i was very sad to come home from yeah yeah in, incredible place i was in tears when i left um the sharing uh the the, the ability to to enjoy 
the, the good things in life every single day because death is so close and you see death every single day, not just for war, but from disease, from starvation. Um, when I had my own, I had in the South, uh, in Coromana, I had my own troops. And um, on a cold night, uh, we would have two men dead from malaria um, on a regular basis. You wake up in the morning, who died of malaria last night? Um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's very different. Uh, you can't tell a blind man what a colour is. People have to experience it. But uh, the beauty of people that live for today and can be happiest with the smallest of things, and then you come home and it's a hell of a shock to find that somebody that says she's traumatised because the nanny had to take a day off or the milkman didn't come, you know. I hate when I've been out travelling the world and experiencing this incredible hospitality, which I've had in 85 countries now. And you get back to bloody London airport or somewhere and you speak to the guy in baggage or whatever to get your back or what, what. And you're like, excuse me, mate, do you, do you know that where I can get the bus to? Yeah. What won't, it's too, I, I know this guy's got an ego problem, but it's still like, you just want to grab that person and say, I wish you'd fucking just been where I've been and seen the utter poverty and the kids dying in front of your eyes. Yeah, you and just you look at you and know, what's your point? Um, like I said, blind, man's in, blind men and colours, you know, they don't care. Um, you've got, in Britain today, I find that everybody's so densely packed in. Um, there's, and every, every, everybody's wound up by social media and by the national media as well are made to feel anxious all the time. And they forget how to sing and they forget how to dance and they forget how to sit around as a family and share food and laugh and take the mickey out of one another and not take everything so seriously. I mean, how can you have humour if every word has to be taken seriously and um, disassembled and turned into something that it is, was never intended to be? Yeah. Um, so yeah, British society, people complain about them, their mental health a lot of the time. But it's the engagement that they have with society through a camera rather than by sitting at a table. People say things on a camera or on the Internet that they would never dare say to somebody sat in the same room. Uh, why do they do it? Because they feel safe to be as rude and horrible as they wish. And people remember the frowny faces, not the happy faces. You know, so uh, chill out, sing more, yeah. you know, make a fool of yourself. Have a laugh. Yeah. I was at the, I, we, we actually lived, um, was it, Nicola Porto was the city, wasn't it? We lived in M Muzwani Bairo, which just, I think Bairo is Portuguese for village, um, right on the cliff overlooking that beautiful, was it the Indian Ocean? Yeah. Um, or the Mozambique Channel? Yeah, that's it. And at weekends, we had a friend who was a sort of, uh, aid worker there I actually know he was in um, customs at the port and he'd rock up in his Land Rover because we didn't have transport and take us out to one of the beaches not not every weekend but did this five or six times and I'm not sure if it's Naiharengi beach or whether that's I'm getting the name wrong there but I was fishing with my Hungarian friend Jolt and uh, I'd taken my backpack off and Amongst the various things in there was a mask and snorkel my stepfather had, had given me before I left the UK and went, hey, our son, you take that one. And he was a lovely, lovely man, Dave. Died, died very, very, very young, tragically. Um, and he was very, very, even um, incredibly ill at that time, dying of leukemia. So the fact he'd given me this mask was a, a special thing. So I took my backpack, my day sack off, put it down on, 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 on the rocks, walked to the edge as you do and, and cast out. The next thing, I hear Jolt saying, Chris, look. And I looked over, two locals, and I'd wondered why I'd seen these black faces popping up in, in, in you know, the, the scrub in Mozambique. It's <laughs> thick, yeah. thick thorn scrub, isn't it? It's almost, yeah. almost impenetrable. Mm. And I looked over my shoulder, these guys legged it out of the, the, the bush, ran across these razor sharp rocks, 
they were razor sharp. I, as a Westerner, you never, you could never have gone barefoot for for, for, for on them. Obviously, I have my my flip my sandals on. Hopped across these rocks as if they were nothing. Grabbed my bag, and he was off. My first thought was that diving mask from my from my stepdad, and I just choked. Hold the fishing rod, and I tore after them, Robin. Probably a bit of a silly thing to do, but I charged into that scrub a hundred mile an hour. The thorns were just ripping or ripping my clothes apart, and I'm sc screaming in Portuguese, "I'm going to kill you!" <laughs> right, um, in the hope that having an Acuna, so a Westerner, uh, shouting, "I'm going to kill you!" and and not giving up would just be enough for them to drop the bag. And lo and behold, I got about 30 feet into this thing. I, I, by the time I got there, it was completely um, torn up. And there was my bag. And I lifted the flap. Oh, it was all, all still in there, including my bottle of rum. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, yes, Mozambique, incredible. Just in, an incredible place to visit. When when you and I were there, it was war torn and smashed up, and everywhere stunk of uh, can we say you you know what? Because obviously there were no toilets. Were, were not, was when the Portuguese left, they filled the sewers with concrete, didn't they? As in in almost in spite of the of the locals, so there were mm. no sewers or anything. They talk about feet and going over rocks. I used to take my soldiers um, for runs in the morning. Uh, inside the inside the minefield perimeter, and uh, they used to take their boots off to go running because the boots were for, for, were for parades. Yeah, and, um, you know, so when they were in uniform properly, they put their boots on, but they preferred it without them. But their their soles are their feet. When we finished the run, they would be pulling camel thorns out of their feet and just you know, no big deal. Mm. <laughs> Unbelievable. We used to hold football matches at the school, and um, the lads would rock up. Only half of them had training shoes. Most of the trainers were donated. So um, when you go in a, a shoe shop and you buy a new pair and they say, do you want to leave your old pair here? That's that's where they go. They get given to some aid organisation who then gets them out to such countries. So only half the guys would have tra in, um, training, or a quarter rather. And what they would do is one would wear the right and one would wear the left. It doesn't matter even if you were a, a right foot striker that you you might have a left just just the left uh, the kid the football the the kids played with not 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 in this case they don't have a proper football for these kind of sunday league matches yeah but the children in the school they get a carrier bag twist it up wrap it around itself get another carrier bag twist it up until they had a football size clump of carrier bags that they then bound with with a string and that they had nothing else robin well i don't i don't need to tell you do i they didn't have any western toys nothing some you know, of them when, were... when they're um worried about illness when they're worried about their family when they're worried about enough food when they're um you know when they're worried maybe that the roof's coming down because we've had a hurricane or something like that you know, they don't have time to worry about their mental health. They only worry about what's really, really important on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if you ask them something along the lines of, you know, how do you feel? They will tell you how they feel in that moment. They wouldn't be worrying about how they're going to feel tomorrow or how something's affecting them. They would, they're just getting on and living life. And um, it's not a bad idea. Yes, exactly. One of the poems in your book, you might have to give me a steer or I'll be here forever. It's the one about the mother, wasn't it? We were discussing it earlier. Yeah, Unspoken Love. Yeah, what page are we, we on, just so I can refer? Yeah, it's near the back. It's coming towards the end of the book, Unspoken Love. And it's about my, it's, my mother died when she was 37. She had me when she was 17. And so, yeah, it's page 89. And um, when you're a, a selfish young person or getting on with your life and growing up, you don't have much appreciation for your parents. And um, 
she was gone before I was old enough to appreciate her. And I grew up in an environment where we didn't touch, we didn't shake hands, we didn't express our feelings for one another. And, um, you know, so the poem's called Love Unspoken. And it's about how we felt for one another, but um, we didn't say it. We didn't express it. That's about that, you know. So. Yes, I'm not going to... Um read any unless Robin particularly wants to. Um, You're a good reader. <laughs> You're a good reader. <laughs> You're a good reader. Well, <laughs> funny you should say that. I um, I was in a library group once when I was a youth, uh, no, I think it was when I was a substance misuse specialist, so basically a drug worker, used to go to this organisation because one of my clients used used to attend and I would go there to sort of um, chaperone him for want of an incorrect <laughs> wrong want of the proper term and um in this library they said right who's going to read the the book next and someone said chris would you and of course i was just getting into writing my own books then and that sort of thing and um sometimes you can really nail it you can get oh, yeah. you know the pauses in the right place clarity of voice yeah really just and um and other times you you when you try talking into one of these to record your audio book yeah. you just think you sound like an absolute plank <laughs> you you sound much better if you're stood up um, because your lungs work better and if you've written it yourself obviously the the emotion and the depth and the rhythm is exactly how you want it to be rather than somebody else doing it i mean the one of the joys i mean i broke my neck when i was 54 and I was having some real problems with recovery, not in terms of paralysis, but in terms of constant headaches. And um, so I thought I'd take my mind off it by uh, going to university. I couldn't teach karate anymore. So I went off to university as an undergrad at 56. And I did creative writing with um, English literature. But the one thing in the creative writing that really gripped me was that I knew absolutely nothing about poetry and its different forms and its different makeups and, and how it works and how clever it can actually be. And although we use it, we don't understand, we can sing a song, but we don't understand how to write the, write the song or write the music. And it really gripped me. And so um, I wanted to use some of that three years of academia in, uh, in, in Warrior Poet Soldier's Songs to um, try and express some of the things I'd learned. And it really is a labor of love. Um, it's not a commercial product, you know, um, uh, write something about bombs and guns and gats and bash them and smash them. And, you know, you're going to get a, you're going to get an audience. But um, I'm hoping that there's a certain clientele out there that will uh, take the time to sit down and, and try to um, just see what, the, what, the, what, what it's about. It's, um, it's got things about suicide, deaths of my friends in war. Um, it's got um, that hard attitude as well as the, um, the, the sort of morose attitude. It's got that, uh, come on, get stuck in there, atom and fashion. And, you know, it's got some of that in there as well, because there needs to be a balance. But yeah, it's very much a labour of love. Yeah. It, we'll, we'll, I want to talk about literature and, and your depth of knowledge and, and that sort of thing. Even you, you mentioned the sagas later on in your book, the kind of the Norsk, or Icelandic texts that, that, that is how they how they remembered history, isn't it? Um, but just this this love unspoken. So this is the poem about your mother, and it's really funny. Well, it's not funny; it's the wrong word. Yeah. But grief is a funny thing because I I choose I try not to do it. I yeah. I've had some close people die to me, most in just tragic circumstances. Um, my best mate, Lee, drowned when we were on holiday in Portugal. That's a funny situation to be in, stood on a beach with your best mate's dead body at your feet. Didn't even know, I hadn't even met his parents, Robin. It was just, but, I'm just like, okay, hey ho, let's move on. Next, you know, it, 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 and I just try and celebrate life, and I, I don't want to go there, you know, and I certainly don't want to 
like dine out on that sort of shit, you, you know, and have it be my 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 moniker that oh, this is so I, I, I don't deal with it. I move on. Me too. I tend, I tend to have one bloody good cry that comes about a month later, triggered by something. Lee triggered me because he'd left um, to uh, a tea stain in my kitchen. I remember saying to him, "Oi!" And, it, and months later, it was still on. It was on a plastic bag, and I, I just looked at it, and then it was God. The floodgates open. Well, you're crying for yourself because the grief is your experience. The person who's gone is gone. So you're crying for yourself. Your loss. It's your loss, not theirs. Yeah. When when my my mum died, it was a it was a funny situation, and I hope to our young people who might be watching this, you can maybe take something from this. But one of my best experiences as a a toddler stroke child was going shopping with my mum. And I think you say here we held on to the the pram or whatever. No. I remember going shopping with my mum and come on son, you know, come on Chris, we've got and. It was such a lovely feeling. I'm with my mum, right? And yet, as got older and went through lots of upheaval, I think three three separations led to divorce. I, I won't even go into the depths of what went on, but it was it wasn't wasn't very pleasant. Um, and off the back of that, there was lots of remarriages way more than you need in this life <laughs> you know hopefully you can do it in a one of folks i won't even get married I, i've got a girlfriend and she's just awesome right anna waited 45 years for her um but i didn't always hit it off with my mum, and, and we would just it, is, it was all personality issues robin you know she had a lot going on i don't i to this day i couldn't tell you why because that generation would never discuss it with you, right? My son, I'll tell him everything. You know, well, he's young. I don't obviously go too deep, but he's going to know all my faults, right? All the stupid things I've done. I'll, if, I'm, if I do wrong, I'm going to say sorry, right? And I, he gets I love you 50 times a day, along with 50 hugs and about 500 kisses every day <laughs> probably doing this a bit wrong folks but maybe i'm overcompensating i had one hug off my dad as a kid one and it was when he come back from the pub a bit a bit pissed um no it's not slagging my dad off this is how things very often were back then people not in touch with their feelings and all kinds of um um like bullshit etiquette really that people conform to and it, it was just all a bit silly but so there I am two days after or three days after my mum died and I'm so glad that we got it together in the end and I was able to nurse her she, she died of asbestos poisoning she was a nurse in, in Charing Cross Hospital in London after the war, the place was full of asbestos because of the rebuilding from the bombing. And there she was trying to do her best for people as a nurse, poisoners, poisoning herself as she worked there. And um, that the mesophilioma, you're usually you're dead in three months. She actually went on for a year. So we had a, a, a bit more time, time with her than, than most people get. And in that time, there was no argy-bargy. There wasn't, there wasn't going to be any arguments. It was just me and my mum. Um, and as I think I said to you, Robin, two days after she died, I went to the house. I was met with more cards than I've ever seen in my life. So I start to read them, you know, one at a time. And it's and it was to her husband at the time, it was a chap called Paul. Um, Paul, Barbara was just the loveliest woman we ever had the pleasure to meet. Every time I walked past her showing shop, she, you know, she would wave. Every time I took a pair of jeans in, she'd just take them up. For... Robin, I'm reading about a woman I never knew. I never knew this, you know. Um, so I'd encourage anybody out there, don't 
get over whatever you're try and understand your parents because if they're a bit knobby it's probably because they've had a bit of a shit end of the stick themselves right and they ain't going to change it's just it seems to be the nature of things people have a lot of pride and well get rid of your pride you know give your parents a hug tell tell them that you love them and uh you know don't do what i did which is find out two days after they're gone um mum died god years ago now robin but i think it's only just i'm only just starting to think about it now um so thank you for your thank you for your poem yeah i hope somebody can engage with it you know that's wow. the thing. you've you've done you've you've achieved what all writers dream of which is you've got one person who's engaged and that's all you need isn't it anyone else is a bonus well I'm, 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 I'm proud of it regardless. Um, it's, um, it's a work of art and, um, you know, it, all, it has a limited audience, but uh, I'm glad it's out there. I think, um, I think it's worth it. <laughs> yes. You're obviously very well read or, or, well, there's lots of books out there, aren't there? So that's kind of subjective, but is it, how did you get in? Have you always been a reader? Yeah, I've always loved um, books. I love books more than television. <laughs> um, I think um, being a soldier, um, you know, I didn't, the idea of going into the TV room and not being able to watch the programme you want because the other lads are watching Top of the Pops or something, you know, so um, mm. you, uh, I, 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 could, I could escape in books. I remember being uh, stuck up in the barracks in Northern Ireland, um, you know, reading um, Leon Uris as Trinity. Um, and then gradually getting into more and more books and then being in the jungle. And, um, you know, once it gets dark in the jungle, you don't move. So you like a light a little candle and then you can't sleep because you're not, maybe not that tired. So you light a candle and you get this big book that's going to last you for the four or five weeks that you're there. And um, so you start to read more and more. And nowadays I tend to have about six, six books on the go at the same time but different books. So I'm reading, um, what am I reading at the moment? I'm reading Barack Obama's A Promised Land. I'm reading The Rise and Fall of Communism. Um, I'm reading um, um, a Stephen Hawking's book that I can't remember the title of. But I'm, and I leave them around the house and the most difficult one I leave in the toilet. <laughs> and uh, um, and they're, they're different books, but they're um, words, words of power. If you're eloquent, I mean, so many people out there that want to say something, but won't say anything at all because they don't feel that they have the vocabulary to express themselves. So hey, words most, of power. Most of, most of the ones that express themselves to me haven't got the vocabulary. It doesn't, doesn't yeah. seem to bother them. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, so but there are people that really have something important they want to say. If you say it for them. Then they're, they're really pleased because they go, yes, that's, that's what I wanted to say. That's what I meant. He said it for me. Good for him. And um, reading, reading people, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a great admirer of Barack Obama. Um, and I'm a great admirer of Boris Johnson as well. But reading the eloquence in their, in their language, and some of it's written for them, but it, it means a great deal to me. And I, I, I take little notes and go, that's how I wanted to say it. That's how I'm going to say it in the future. Because... Um, words are power. Um, we're all, people control us with their words and they lift our emotions and they drop our emotions. It's what theatre does. Mm -hmm. It's what music does. Um, so, and poetry is emotion in words. So that connection. So a lot of us get frustrated because we're angry about something, but we can't express it. So we do it with swear words or frustration because we can't actually say what it is that's making us angry in a way that won't make the other person angry. You know, so, ooh, you know, we, we yeah, rely you, on our body language or telepathy. You've perfected the art, haven't you, of replying to people. I've noticed that on your social media. You're, you're always very gracious, <laughs> but quite direct. And, and um, yes, I think it's good. I, I, it's, it's, a diff, it's a difficult place to be when you're in the public eye and you've got social media, because is that your page where people come to celebrate you because they enjoy what you do, what you say, what, how, how you enable their lives? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I've got, I, I got the old wise, wise old paratrooper stuff that goes out, you know, which is what I named uh, my little trilogy of books, wise old paratrooper books. But I kept coming out with these little short uh, maxims, these little short sayings that um, would carry a message. And so, you know, the wise old paratrooper tag started to attach to me. And then you start to get people asking you in private on Messenger for advice. And many times they start by attacking you so they're going, you shouldn't have said this, you shouldn't have done that, you're an, an F in this and so on, you know. And then you start to talk back to them in a reasonable and understanding way. And in, in some cases, not in all, in some cases, you end up being their counsellor or their guide. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's quite humbling and quite nice, too, to be able to use your language skills with, with a certain amount of benefit to others. But that's teaching as well. That's what teachers do. And I love teaching. So there's an aspect of teaching to those comments but when you come across people who open an engagement on social media with an insult then it's best just to block and delete <laughs> block and delete and occasionally i get i'm in a bad mood or you know something i'm not too happy on that particular day and i'll i'll send a cutting comment back um and then i'll feel bad about it and i'll delete it <laughs> you know, so um best not to engage yes the 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 more the bigger your audience becomes it it really starts to become a juggling thing because am i going to reply to a guy that's just been rude about either myself or my guest right and it's and if i take the might be 15 minutes to to get the reply to mean what you want it to mean yeah. then it doesn't end there very often robin it's a oh chris i'm so sorry um yeah love your podcast mate love what you do right it's the same when i meet someone in public and i happen to know what they've been saying in uh, um you know behind my back and and it and it's, are you chris Rule? oh i love your and it's like, okay do you and I, yeah i flew all the way to hong kong to have one of those um yeah those type <laughs> meetings believe me, that was quite that you walk into a a bar in Hong Kong and you just walk up to the guy that's been slagging you off on social media for the last six months, calling you a, basically a water or whatever. Not, not, not that I, I, but when, I when people do that, when people do that, it says so much to the public about them. It says nothing about you. And there's, there's, there's one individual in the whole world who spends an awful lot of his time and energy um, doing that to me. And um, all he's doing is, is telling everybody what he is rather than what I am. So, you know, you've just got to get a bit thick skinned and um, just ignore it. It really is, it can be tough. And who the hell would want to be a politician? Eh? Who the hell? <laughs> what I was, um, what I'm sort of thinking now is it's like, dude, I could spend 50 minutes replying. You wrote, if you're going to be one of these people that just comes back and you haven't completely mm -hmm. haven't either listen to what I said or being gracious. Sorry, dude, you're gone. It's because my, I could be with my son. And then it gets to the point, Robin, where who should you be replying to? And it gets hard because some people are very kind. They say, Chris, and they'll write a whole thing. And at the end, they'll say, look, please don't reply to me. I know you're busy, right? And, and they get it, right? Others send me... 30 video links videos are an hour and a half each and i think you don't really understand like what what the life of a content producer is like what it takes to to try to try to make a success of something in this world without having a you know outside of a, a job i i don't have a time to watch a half hour video that I yep. want to watch, let alone to watch 32 hour videos that I don't get me wrong, folks. I, I, I appreciate the, the connection, um, but it does get to the point where who should you be replying to? Because my boy comes first, Robin, you know, my boy comes first and I've already spent too much time. Um, yeah. And it must I, I get, I get people complaining that I don't respond to them and, um, so I'll put up a general post saying, guys, you know, I'd love to respond to everybody, but sometimes I'll get I'll get six or seven hundred different comments in a day. And um, you know, I can't, but I do scan through them to see if there's anything of 
you know, that I, I think is of great importance, but you can't reply to everybody much as you'd like to. And um, the same goes for people that um, will, will, will send you links. Well, if you've got a link, stick it up on, stick it up on Facebook. Don't send it to me on Messenger, you know, because I, there's just not enough hours in the day and I've got a life too. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just having to start to get team members involved now, but and I've got wonderful people on the on the on the team um, because they're just there isn't enough hours in the day, is there? They, 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 no. And it's not. It becomes not fair on you in the end because I can sit here, get to the end of a day. I might have been up since well, this morning I was up at four. Um, out running, I think by half four, shower for five. Um, then I'll sit down at the computer and I can still be here at 10 o'clock at night and I've not done one single piece of work. I've just spent it re replying yeah. to this, this, this uh, you know, the emails that just keep coming, the comments keep coming, the messages. And you've got to ask yourself, hang on, what am I? Am I do I produce stuff or do I just... Yeah, don't think there's a I definitely think there's a way to get a balance um but I can understand people like the Joe Joe Rogan and who yeah he just um doesn't reply to any I think he's got well, a that's, that's, that's what you, you need to when you get to that level of celebrity you you just need to um let people know that you know you're you're seeing their stuff but you haven't got time to uh, get back to them and um and carry on and not not worry about it because five minutes later they've written it and they're not worried about you <laughs> yeah exactly. not, and if somebody's doing something negative sometimes they're just getting some kind of satisfaction out of prompting a response from you anyway mm. um people people who put up an insult shouldn't expect you to read the next sentence because i don't <laughs> if it starts with you're a twat you know then um then that's it it's blocked and deleted the rest of it doesn't count <laughs> It's, just, it's sad that there's so many unhappy people in, in, in this modern life is creating more of this. There was a time if you engaged, interacted with another person, you, you had to be polite. It's just the way it was. If you, you didn't, get punched in the nose. if you didn't, <laughs> yeah. you got one of those and then you went, do you know what? I'm actually going to be a bit more polite. Now. But yeah, funny, funny life, isn't it? Well, it's, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier on about doing your, um, your 10 secrets for success and there's a, exactly that point in it yeah. you know <laughs> you know don't let people use your good manners against you mm. did you say the in the paris you were watching top of the pops oh yeah definitely I, abba abba <laughs> well yeah i get that i get that i just i would picture you more watching cooking cooking programs and <laughs> i had to watch what everybody else had to watch you had a television room the one television in it that you were allowed to watch on a Wednesday night, and um, you went in there and put Top of the Pops was on, and um, that's when I was a boy soldier, and of course you know um, 15, 16 year old boys and that, but they they go together very very well, and that's what everybody wanted to watch, and probably me too. Um, My day it was all videos, so can you imagine trying to watch the watch till the end of a film when your guard shift changes every four hours? <laughs> It's almost almost a bit necky to put a film on because you're you're going to watch it, but half of these guys are, are only going to get are only going to watch. Well, before videos, we had books. <laughs> One of the yes. books I read as a boy soldier was The Exorcist, and um, you know, uh, it's uh, I was 16, 16 and a half when I was reading it. Scary book, mm. scary book to read. I mean, the film, okay, everyone was kicking up hell about the film and people parading outside cinemas and um, and saying how terrible and destructive it was. But a uh, 16 year old reading that book. Yeah, I remember that. That was uh, that was quite a book, but a book, you put it down, you pick it up, you put it down, you pick it up. Um, that's why it's something real that you can hold on to as well, rather than an ebook. You know, much as I sell my books on Kindle, um, not worry a poet because, um, because it's illustrated and you can't really get those illustrations across very well on kindle but um so that's going to be that's going to be what it is yeah that's going to be what it is that photograph was taken on mount longdon it's an artistic expression of a photograph 
but that was taken on Mount Longdon by one of my old platoon sergeants called uh, Graham Colbeck, and he's credited at the beginning of the book for that. Um, so it's a, it's an actual. It's not an it's not an imaginary scene. It's a real scene. I just I'd encourage anybody to read Vince Bramley's book. I think it's called Excursion to Hell. As I said, I'm not sure if I said it in this podcast or the one before, um, but it's. If you look at the description below this video that says Chris Frull's shop and all the books in the podcast you can find there. And there's also all the books that I've loved in my life that really have helped shape the person that I've become. Um, someone that's just massively wanted to see the whole world in latter life, who's taken up the sort of extreme endurance stuff. It's all off the back of I'll read a book and go, I want to do that. Um, yeah, Vince, Vince Bramley's book about it mainly centers on the attack on Mount Longdon and it's just an eye opener. Yeah, real, real, real eye opener. Yeah, that, um, you know, that was uh, that was that was real soldiering without any doubt at all. You know, I mean, all soldiering where people have got guns on the other side and shoot them at you is real soldiering. I'm not putting anything down, but you, it's the last time that the Air Force, the Navy and the Army were involved in together in combined operations um, and um, in, a, in, in a scenario that was straight out of, in some ways, the Second World War. It really was. Yeah. Bloody RAF had to do some work, didn't they? <laughs> Everybody did, mate. I, um, when I got picked up, I parachuted into the sea and got picked up by the Andromeda and um, the uh, morale and the spirit of the the Matlows, the Navy guys, was tremendous. I mean, I'm a lousy seaman, you know, I just want, one of them gave me his bunk to uh, lay on because I get seasick very, very easily and um, brought me tea and everything. <laughs> you weren't with Bob Shepard by any chance, were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I spoke to, I was on the phone to Bob a couple of days ago. Um, he's in, in New York now. Yeah, I'm in touch with him, yeah. He said, uh, he's come, friends, he's coming on the show uh, in a couple of weeks' time. He said, yeah, we parachuted into the sea. I'm like, whoa, slow, 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 slow down. Whoa, whoa. You can't do this on the podcast. You, you've got, do you want to tell us a bit more about that, Robin? Because it really sounds... Yeah, well, we, um, we, it was coming towards the end of the campaign and we were supposed to go into Argentina and uh, on a one-way mission to take out the jets that were sinking our ships. But uh, the mission finally got cancelled. So our commanding officer managed to get us um, permission to fly down and do another mission uh, coming into, possibly coming into Port Stanley from the rear. Um, but so there were two aircraft with 65 SAS soldiers bursting to get into the war still, um, flying down. One of the aircraft's um, refueling nozzle broke. So that one had to turn back. So now there's 35 of us. And uh, we get down there and um, all our equipment has been uh, prepared by the RAF uh, in one ton boxes to go out the back on heavy drop parachutes. So we're all standing there waiting to jump out in dry suits. Out goes the, uh, out goes all our equipment and all the parachutes come off. And so, um, and we follow it out and all our equipment is bombing the ships that are waiting in the sea to pick us up. So there we are, you know, 35 men from B Squad and 22 SAS uh, arrived to take part in the war. And um, our kit, most of our kit goes to the bottom of the ocean. Um, we get picked up and put on the ship. But the Argentinians, fair to fair, the Argentinians heard that these 30 men from B Squad and 22 SAS had arrived. And uh, two days later, they surrendered. So, yeah, job done. <laughs> hey, they're only human, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you have any country wants to get kitted out for, 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 for a conflict, just hoover up the bottom of the South Atlantic, isn't it? I think all of our, a lot of our equipment went, went down there, sadly. Yeah, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of good ships, a lot of good men as well, yeah. yeah. And a yeah. lot of good, uh, good Chinooks, wasn't it? Well, the Atlantic conveyor was first hit when it was in uh, San Carlos Harbour and um, went down with our sea harriers, yeah. Yeah, incredible, incredible. Can we do our um, 10 points? 
Yes, let's bring this part to a close because I'll put that out as a, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a separate one. So, Robin, here's the book, folks, to our dear friends at home. Warrior Poet, A Soldier's Songs, highly, highly recommended. Give this to, definitely give this to any veteran and they'll, um, that will be something that they will, 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 will treasure. But as I said earlier, um, I think it's to be appreciated by by everybody. Um, if I could ask you all at home, please like and subscribe so we can keep keep building the channel and have more um, enlightening and educating chats like that. That would be wonderful. And Robin, until the next time. <laughs>